mechanical and aerospace engineer Philip Watts from California. Marine biologist Frank Fish from Pennsylvania. And filmmaker and entrepreneur Stephen Dewar from Toronto. Three men thousands of miles apart. So what connects them all? We all love the sea and we all love animals. We're all interested in the relationship between biology and technology. We all wanted to build something new and sustainable. We founded a company we called Whale Power. Efficient turbine blades copied from nature. It was a chance occurrence over 35 years ago that ultimately led to the invention on which their company is based. I was on vacation in Boston and went into this shop that had all this animal art. And in the center of the shop was a pedestal with a little figurine of humpback whales. And I looked at that and I saw that the leading edge of the flippers of the humpback had these bumps on them. And that made no sense compared to what I knew about fluid mechanics and just looking at airplanes, you always have a straight leading edge. And so I had to know what was going on with these whales and why they had these curious bumps. From then on, the question really got him thinking. He watched humpback whales in the water. They glide and turn lightly and elegantly on their own axis, even though they're as large and as heavy as a bus. Seven years later, Fish had the chance to examine the flipper of a stranded humpback. He felt that the bump on the flipper, called a tubercle, was somehow related to the whale's swimming skills. For the humpback whale, the, having the tubercles delay stall to higher angles, and so the whale can develop lift and thus turn tightly. If it didn't have the tubercles and its flipper stalled, it would be like driving on a road that's covered by ice. And when you take a turn, instead of following the curve, what would happen is you would go off tangentially. He recreated the almost two meter long flipper on the computer and also made an X-ray image. His hypothesis was confirmed, but how could he prove it? And I went around to a number of people and uh, I got some interest, but I never got much interest at all. And then what happened is I met this person, Phil Watts. Phil Watts is not a biologist, but an engineer. A man who loves the sea and loves animals. With his expertise in mechanical engineering and in aviation, he was just the man for the job. I had already been working in biomechanics, and so I understood uh, the importance of biomimicry about drawing engineering ideas from evolution. And uh, when Frank shared that humpback whales were the only whales that had bumpy leading edges on their flippers, I immediately realized that that could have some important engineering consequences. So I ran some uh, fluid dynamic simulations of wings with tubercles and wings without tubercles. And the tubercles increased the lift and simultaneously reduced the drag. And for uh, an engineer who works on wing performance, that's a spectacular achievement to be able to increase the lift and reduce the drag at the same time. Further investigations followed, now with several researchers involved. Soon it became clear that these were bumps with benefits. Tubercles uh, focus the flow between the bumps, and that focused flow helps keep the flow attached to the wing, and it also helps isolate the lift in between the tubercles. So if you have a bump here and a bump here, we're going to get a high lift region in between. And what improved the performance in the water could also bring big benefits in the air. And so what the tubercles do is they prevent the flipper or any wing from stalling. A stall is when uh, the wing or flipper would lose its lift. Now, for a whale, that's not a big deal because the animal is neutrally buoyant in the water. So it's not gonna fall out of the water. For a plane, if it stalls, then you start falling out of the sky. The marine biologist and the engineer jointly published their research results. 
and they formulated a first patent for tubercle technology. 700 kilometers away, Canadian journalist and entrepreneur Stephen Dewar read about their work and was instantly captivated. I was struck by the fact that this totally changed what we thought we understood about flow management. I was so taken by this that I tried to contact the scientists. So I called Frank and Phil, and we were talking about how this all worked. And I asked them what they were doing with it commercially. They called me back the next day and said, can we set up a company with you? <laughs> and we were off and running. The whale power team developed prototypes and tested them. They measured 20% energy savings, improved efficiency, greater stability, and greater durability as a result. A second patent was filed, this time covering Europe, the US, and several other countries. Our tests have shown that blades with tubercles are more energy efficient and quieter than standard blades. And so we can use this for applications such as wind turbines, fans, compressors, and pumps. Our plans with whale power were to make designs and prototypes that could demonstrate the technology which we would license to manufacturers. And that's what we've been doing. From small fans for cooling computers to larger ceiling-mounted fans, retrofit models for turbines and wind farms, and much more. One is already under license, the others are planned for the future. Tubercle technology is both sustainable and unique, and it owes its existence to three men who were inspired by the secrets of nature. From animals, we can learn so much. We just have to look carefully. Tubercles are a technology for the future. They'll allow us to create a sustainable planet and allow future generations to thrive. We were able to get an understanding of what was possible because nature had done so much work on this. Malmö, a Swedish metropolis full of fascinating contrasts. Tradition and innovation, water and land, old buildings and modern architecture. And Malmö is where the young industrial designer Merdad Majubi lives and works. Even as a student, he realized that he was more interested in what went on inside a building than in how it looked from the outside. How are we going to use our vital resources in the future? Water is one of our most important ones, so we must focus on it. All our buildings are permeated by an invisible and highly dense network of water pipes, the arteries that supply our cities. And passing through those pipes every second are vast amounts of purified water. Domestic consumption of fresh water in Western Europe is around 200 litres per person per day. For things like washing up, cooking and cleaning. In a city like Malmö, with around 300,000 inhabitants, that adds up to 60 million litres every day. One of the biggest wasters of water is the shower. Only 10% of the water gets contaminated by soap and dirt. The remaining 90%, heated and almost clean, drains away into the sewage system as so-called waste water. So we need to save water. But who would invent an entire shower to do just that? He did. A conventional shower uses more than 100 litres of water in 10 minutes, and then you also need 5 kilowatt hours of energy to heat the water up to body temperature. Our shower needs fewer than 5 litres of water and less than 1 kilowatt hour, because we recycle the water. 
But just because saving water is the number one priority doesn't mean the shower should be any less enjoyable, the designer says. This isn't just about creating a product that saves more water and energy. It also has to make showering even more comfortable and enjoyable. Here you can see that we use an especially large shower head with lots of water flowing through it, making showering as comfortable as possible. Interestingly enough, despite the large shower head, a great deal of water is saved. The trick, a closed loop shower system. The interior is a cleverly designed recycling system, a kind of miniature wastewater treatment plant. The water flows from the pipe into the shower head. At the drain, a sensor checks 20 times every second to see if the quality of the water is sufficient for cleaning. If so, its recycling journey begins. A microfilter strains out larger particles, such as skin or hair. Another filter removes impurities in the nano range. Ultraviolet light kills harmful germs. Then the water, only a few degrees cooler at this point, passes through a heater, which warms up until it reaches a pleasant shower temperature. Purified in real time, the water is now even cleaner than that in normal taps and is ready for the next shower again and again. The inventor's technology is a completely new approach. It's currently the most efficient shower system for saving water and energy in the world. Only contaminated water is exchanged immediately. The rest is recycled. To keep things hygienic, the filters are exchanged every 200 showers or so. The filters are easy to exchange and hold around 20,000 litres, so a family would need to replace them around three times a year. Majubi's shower system has already been installed in several hotels, as well as in hospitals and gyms. That is, wherever a lot of people shower, and hygiene is especially important. One of our first customers was a hospital. One day they had an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease, and all their water pipes were contaminated with bacteria. That wasn't the case with the showers we'd supplied, though, thanks to the closed-loop cleaning process in our system. Majubi's shower of the future is also smart. Water consumption and also service data such as filter changes are recorded digitally and can be easily monitored by users. One smartphone app, for instance, even shows how much water has been saved. The inspiration for Majubi's invention came from his time at university when he studied space travel for a mission to Mars. How can you generate clean water without having to take gallons of it with you into space? I was involved in a project with NASA at the University of Lund. We wondered whether we could live under the same conditions on Mars as we do on Earth. Then I realized that we'd have to use our resources as cleverly as possible. And that's what we're doing here. The name of his company, Orbital Systems, is a reminder of that time. But Majubi's developments are intended for people on Earth. His inventions are the subject of several granted patents or patent applications relating to different elements of the system. Over 50 employees are now working on further development and distribution. So the shower system is becoming less expensive all the time and can be adopted worldwide. Since showers use up one-third of the water in a household, saving water with this technology is already having a huge impact in more and more markets. With rapid urban growth worldwide, water scarcity will become an increasingly urgent problem, impacting all levels of the population. And that is precisely why Merdad Majubi's shower is an invention for the future.
Wind, it's an unlimited source of energy. But could we use it to meet the power requirements of the entire planet? We can try. A lifetime of trying began with a simple weekend trip to the seaside taken by a father and his 12-year-old son. It was a stormy day, and we wanted to watch the big waves. When we reached the dunes, we really had to battle against the wind. You could just lean into the wind for support and almost fly along with it. I've never forgotten the sheer power of it. I had a feeling that it could surely be put to some kind of good use. His feeling was right. From that day forward, Henrik Stiesdale, who is now 61, devoted his entire career to wind energy as an engineer. He found a way of generating energy far out to sea. He developed rotor blades up to 80 meters long that were formed as a single piece. And he made climate neutral energy available to everyone. But first things first. It all began on the family farm in Wilberg. They needed a solution. The farm's energy supply was growing increasingly expensive. After the 1973 oil crisis, electricity became very expensive. I was a student and felt there had to be a radical change. We needed a windmill that would provide enough power for the entire farm. So I started to build a small experimental one. After that, I built a wind turbine three meters in diameter, and we tested that. And finally, I built one 10 meters in diameter. And that supplied almost enough energy for the whole farm. This is the very first windmill I ever built. It's made of two boards glued together and cut into the shape of a propeller and a one centimeter water pipe. So you hold it in your hand like this and you can really feel the energy of the wind. Now you're talking. These experiments made him eager to continue. In 1978, Henrik Stiesdale designed his first commercial turbine. It had three rotor blades. That was far better than the conventional two they had back then. The rotor blades were positioned at the front of the tower and aimed into the wind automatically. And the wind turbine also had a generator, so it could slow down in a light wind and run quickly in a strong one to achieve a maximum degree of efficiency. For the wind industry, this approach was a revolution. The classic designs until then had been based on propellers from the aircraft industry. Henrik's turbine with three rotor blades was far more stable and efficient, and it paved the way for the so-called Danish concept, the dominant concept behind the design of wind farms from the 1980s right up to the present day. The young Henrik Stiesdale kept on improving his turbines in the years that followed. It was in 1991 that he finally realized a mammoth project the construction of the world's first ever offshore wind farm in Vindabu. Once again, he designed the turbines. And not only that, when the quality of the rotor blades failed to live up to his standards, Henrik Stiesdale came up with an entirely new concept. In the mid-1990s, we had big problems with the quality of the rotor blades. At the time, they consisted of two sections, glued together. And the glue connection was the weak point. I concluded that the only radical solution was to dispense with the adhesive bond entirely and to cast the rotor blades in a single piece instead. And here's what his solution looks like from the inside. It's called integral blade. A rotor blade made of fiberglass formed as a single section. Up to 75 meters long, the blades sweep an area equal to two and a half football fields. A true feat of engineering. There are no limits to Steesdale's ideas, onshore or offshore. Even after officially retiring, he developed the Tetra Spa wind turbine platform, and it's changing the industry's entire way of thinking yet again. 
Konventionelle havvindmøller er begrænset til vand. Conventional marine wind turbines are limited to water depths of 40 to 50 meters. That's why it's so hard to build offshore wind farms in, say, California or Japan. They need floating solutions there. Steesdale's idea is to manufacture the equipment on the coast and then to tow it by ship to its destination. There, the ballast tanks are flooded with water, making them sink. So the platform is not fixed rigidly to the seafloor, but anchored using cables. That saves time and money. Steesdale estimates that these floating wind turbines could reduce the cost of offshore energy by up to 75%. So, could wind energy really cover the power requirements of the entire planet? It hasn't yet. But if it ever does, that success will largely be due to Henry Steesdale and his inventions. The light of a laser, a fascinating phenomenon. Electromagnetic waves, intense, sharply focused, and sometimes destructive, a light of almost mythical power. For me, laser light is the most beautiful light in the world. But for a long time, Ursula Keller never dreamt that this light would become such an important part of her life and lead to such a great scientific career. With reading and writing, I just messed everything up. I kept getting it all wrong and my work got covered in red ink. But I was really good at mathematics. It really interested me and I enjoyed it. And even though I was a girl growing up in the middle of Switzerland, I was still able to pursue maths and physics. Ursula Keller's talent was recognized and encouraged. She convinced her father to let her study physics at ETH Zurich. Her successful graduation was followed by a scholarship at Stanford University in California. The young Swiss woman then landed in the most renowned research and development laboratory in the world at that time, AT&T Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, USA. When I got there and saw the lab, it was totally full of junk. So the first thing I had to do was clean it all up. But it didn't really bother me because I wanted to do my own research and get something of my own off the ground. Actually, I had complete freedom to go in any direction that interested me. On the one hand, it was a bit scary, but on the other, it was incredibly exciting. The lab table, where Ursula Keller spent four years researching, now stands in her institute in Zurich. After all, it's the table where she revolutionized laser physics for the first time. In principle, a laser functions like this. If you pump energy into a certain medium, a crystal for example, it releases that energy in the form of light. With the help of two mirrors, the light is reflected and repeatedly sent back through the crystal. This creates intense, extremely uniform laser light. Finally, one of the mirrors allows some of the light through. A continuous laser. Ever since the laser was discovered, people have wanted to transform materials with it. But a continuous laser heats up material too much and damages it. The solution? Pulsed laser light. But for a long time, the technology for that was far too complicated. The lasers were also unstable. This was the exact problem that Ursula Keller wanted to solve at the AT&T Bell Laboratories. And she succeeded by installing a small section of semiconductor into the system that had the same effect as a mirror. When laser beams are created, some peaks of higher energy are generated and the semiconductor mirror responds to them in a particular way. The more energy the light contains, the better the mirror reflects it. These high energy peaks take precedence. They're sent back and forth between the mirrors and are amplified. 
When they reach a threshold, the system emits some of the laser light as a short pulse. Ursula Keller called this laser SESAM. SESAM. SESAM is an acronym. It's a semiconductor, saturable absorber mirror. SESAM makes everything much more stable, shorter and better. And far easier too, of course. The entire iPhone wouldn't exist without these short pulse lasers. SESAM has made many things possible. The principle is used today in almost all areas of industry. In welding, in the cutting of materials, in optical communication and in medical technology. SESAM is a scientific sensation. It was Ursula Keller's first big success. Just one year after inventing it, the young physicist was awarded a professorship back home in Zurich. At first I thought it was a joke. During my entire time at ETH Zurich, I had never seen any female professors. Also, I was extremely young. I was only 33 years old. But the conversation got more serious and in the end, they finally made me an offer I simply couldn't refuse. So I became the first woman to be awarded a professorship in the natural sciences. Keller and her team improved the SESAM technology even further. Then she decided to try to produce the shortest laser pulses in the world, using entirely new technology. The physicist was constantly pushing the limits of what was possible. Deeper research into laser technology finally gave Keller a completely new idea. A clock. No, not an elegant traditional Swiss timepiece, more of a monstrous measuring device, using laser light as the most accurate second hand in the world. Or rather, an atto second hand. The clock measures in billionths of a billionth of a second. Light needs about a second to reach the moon from Earth. But light only needs one atto second to get from one atom to the next. In other words, we had entered the world of atoms, the world of quantum mechanics. And that's why attosecond time is also referred to as quantum mechanical time. The atto clock enables us to see inside worlds that were previously invisible. It helps us to understand the hidden secrets of life so that they can one day be imitated by technology. In fact, the Atto clock could even be used to investigate our entire physical world view. With these clocks, we're also hoping that, at some point, we'll be able to measure whether our natural constants really are constant after all. After her time at university, together with her husband, Ursula Keller ran a company of her own. They manufacture SESAM lasers for the computer and smartphone industries, hold several patents, and were recently acquired by an American company. The startup now has access to the global market. Another company is being planned with a new patented laser technology. Her lasers will make it possible to examine the skies far more precisely in the search for a second Earth. Ursula Keller. Where will light lead her next? This is Alex Kipman, software engineer and inventor at Microsoft in Seattle, USA. Kipman is working on a technology that we only know from science fiction novels. What you see around is that we'll have 106 cameras, there's 53 IR cameras, 53 normal high resolution cameras, there's microphones all around so we can capture beautiful spatial audio. Kipman wants to place the laws of space and time on hold and then beam people from one place to another. To do that, here in the so-called holographic capture studio, they will create three-dimensional test images. 
The object to be beamed is the master himself. We had a dream about freeing ourselves. From the footage of the 106 cameras, a 3D model is calculated and then transferred to a meeting room a few doors away. And here he is, Kipman as a hologram, talking to his colleagues. We wanted to invent an entirely new way of operating. Kipman and his team haven't managed beaming in real time just yet. The data processing still takes too long. But basically, the technology works. At the heart of it all are these futuristic smart glasses, called the HoloLens, a product to wow the masses. Unlike conventional VR or virtual reality glasses, these ones are intended to fuse the real and virtual worlds into one. Microsoft calls it mixed reality. You see through the real world. It's unlike any other device out there where you're either looking through a screen or you actually don't get to see the real world. Virtual objects that can be positioned, spun and moved around inside a space, just as if they were part of the real world. That's the vision of mixed reality. The only question is, how are the glasses supposed to manage all of that? Feature number one, the sensors. They are constantly measuring what the wearer is doing and what the space around him looks like. This is the depth camera that ships inside of the HoloLens, right here on the sensor bar. It has four different light sources, which means it's able to do spatial mapping and semantic understanding of the spaces with, you know, what we'll call long throw um, lasers here on the bottom. And it does also short throw um, illumination so that we can do things like human understanding, things like gesture recognitions or hand tracking. The sensors are the eyes of the glasses, but all their data would be useless without a powerful computer processor. Even your best-in-class available mobile processor out there, even today, is not capable of processing terabytes of data per second that these sensors are giving you, and then translating them into artificial intelligence, which is what it takes for you to both be able to see a hologram or interact with it. So we had to invent a special piece of silicon. We call it the HPU. Perhaps the most important feature, the lenses. Tiny screens hidden inside the glasses. Uh, most people think that, you know, we can just project an image on the lens. Um, that's actually not the case. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you put your finger right near your eye, you can't focus that close. So we actually have to form the images on the back of your eye, much like the real world happens. Two tiny light projectors on the bridge of the glasses send millions of light rays into lenses 240 times a second. The light rays are distributed there as far down as the lower third. And from there, the rays are directed on towards the eye. So if you put it in front of your eye, think about light expanding this way, this way, and then escaping when it hits total internal reflection and coming this way to the back of your eyes. And that's how the light rays create the virtual image that the viewer sees. But at the same time, the real world remains visible beyond. These lenses are the key to fusing the real world and the virtual world into one. The technology is still in the development stages. Microsoft says that about 50,000 copies have been sold so far. But many believe in the potential of these smart glasses. Experts are predicting that over the next four years, the market for mixed reality applications will grow to over 70 billion euros, becoming three times larger than the market for virtual reality products. But why? In contrast to the closed virtual reality glasses, mixed reality ones offer far more potential applications. Architects and designers can project their models directly onto a space. Manuals for complicated devices can be brought into the real world. Even experts can be brought in directly, whenever help is needed. 
This technology will be uh, something that transforms the way that we communicate in a pretty profound way. I'm from Brazil and my entire family is in Brazil and, and you know, my daughter and my wife are here in the United States. And I do believe and I can't wait to have my daughter, you know, just playing doll in the morning in her room with her little cousins in Brazil. And they forget for a moment that there's any technology involved. Kipman's inventive genius has already earned him numerous patents, including three European ones for the sensor technology in the HoloLens. He won't stop working towards his vision. Mixed reality, the complete fusion of the digital world with the real one. You can find them inside computers, smartphones, cars, household appliances, and robots. Microchips. Our digital world would be impossible without them. And they're getting smarter all the time. In fact, every two years, their performance doubles. But conventional technology is reaching its technical and economic limits to pack even more electronic switches and circuits onto even smaller microchips. For the engineer Eric Lobstra and the physicist Vadim Banin, it's obvious. Light is setting the limits. Microchips are made on silicon wafers by exposing their surface to light like a film, a process known as photolithography. Each chip uh, consists of uh, billions of uh, transistors. So and you cannot carve them with a hand. What you basically do is you make a pattern which you want to project on the wafer. And lithography is that just a machine which projects this pattern on the wafer. The smaller the wavelength, the smaller the lines we can produce. The current generation of chips is made with light with a wavelength of 193 nanometers. Shorter wavelengths just don't work anymore with normal lasers. It's impossible to make better chips using that method. This limitation was already predicted 20 years ago. And that's exactly why Vadim Banin and Eric Lobstra worked on the development of a completely new technology. Extreme Ultraviolet Lithography, or EUVL for short. However, EUVL first needed a new light source. A high-powered laser was fired onto tiny drops of tin, heated up to 500,000 degrees. This process emits extreme ultraviolet light with a wavelength of only 13.5 nanometers. This makes it possible to create electronic structures five millionths of a millimeter in size on a wafer. However, putting the light to work inside a new machine was anything but easy because it gets absorbed by the air and glass. It means that we have to go, to go into high vacuum systems, which we didn't do before and nobody did. And we need to use optics to uh, projection, illumination and projection optics to project the mask on the wafer. And normal optics doesn't work in this wavelength. We have to make a mirrors, and not just mirrors, but multi-layer mirrors. Jake, we do, in an instance, a miracle take a little bit longer. The reflecting material, uh, to make it is not that difficult. To make it efficient is very difficult. The game was to make your mirrors so that they really reflect only the UV and not all the other wavelengths. The mirrors that capture the light and then guide it through the scanner also need extreme performance, and they also have to be incredibly smooth. For comparison's sake, if this mirror was the size of Germany, any unevenness on its surface would need to be no more than one millimeter high. And there was a further challenge. Our big enemy are particles in the system. And even if one particle of dust will get on the, um, our mask and will be projected on, uh, on the wafer, then uh, the chip will not work. And when we talk about the particle of dust, we talk about a particle of the size of 30, 40 nanometers, which is uh, more than 1,000 times smaller than hair size. The solution, a fine membrane to keep away the dust particles. 
extremely thin, but still very robust. But at first, nobody knew how to produce this material. I was uh, watching a, um, a documentary about how they make uh, the swords in Japan. And what they do there, they make a, the swords with a, no, a, a, a lot of layers of the steel. And next day I talked about uh, with a colleague of mine who was uh, pr producing this pro uh, thin, thin membrane. He said, well, that's a good idea. Let's try this. He made a phone call and in two weeks we had the first sample. Like the Japanese katana swords, the membrane now consists of several ultra-thin layers. These keep dust particles away from the mask. But they still allow the extreme ultraviolet light through to expose the wafer. It took 20 years to develop extreme ultraviolet lithography. More than 1,000 people worked on it at ASML alone. Without patents, developments like these would be quite impossible. You need patents to secure that you can do, uh, can use your own inventions, that you can do what you want, that you have your hands free. When uh, the machine will produce uh, the first chip in a mobile device or wherever, it will be kind of uh, quite a life fulfillment. Extreme ultraviolet lithography is now ready for the market. In the future, 256 gigabytes will fit on a microchip the size of a fingernail and it will hardly consume any electricity at all. Technology for a billion euro business. The air we breathe has not been clean for a long time. Too many cars, too many emissions. The combustion of diesel produces especially harmful and invisible toxins, nitrogen oxides. They damage the respiratory tract. According to the World Health Organization, 75,000 people across Europe die each year from the consequences. Making the air not just a bit cleaner, but really clean in the future, that's the vision of this man. The Dane Tue Johannesson, together with his team, developed a revolutionary system to eliminate pollutants from diesel combustion already inside the car a key technology that has numerous benefits. It's an important invention. It not only leads to a very low nitrogen oxide value in the vehicle exhaust, the engine can also run at its optimal operating temperature, leading to a low CO2 value. Fifteen years ago, Tue Johannesson started doing research while still at the Technical University of Denmark. He's now one of the founders of the company to which the university transferred the patents for commercial development. His colleague, Ulrich Quader, is responsible for research and development, while Tue Johannesson himself is the chief technology officer. This collaboration proved successful as far back as their university days. In the team, they worked on the task of reducing vehicle emissions. Johannesson as a chemical engineer, Quader as a physicist. For this, they wanted to use a gas, ammonia. It can bind and reduce gases. However, for decades, ammonia has been used in power plants to reduce NOx. Ammonia can be processed there in its pure form, but using gaseous ammonia in vehicles poses a big safety risk. In its gaseous state, ammonia is dangerous. No one has yet managed to put it into solid, and therefore harmless, form. Not until now, that is. In 2005, the Danes achieved their breakthrough. They present their magic tablet. Outwardly inconspicuous, but inside, ammonia, tamed. In this solid material, ammonia is bound at the center of the crystal structure. This enables very large quantities of ammonia to be stored. It's almost magical that such large amounts of gas can be bound in solid form. The metallic salt pill, weighing just one gram, can store around half a liter of gaseous ammonia. That's invisible to the eye, but it's a sensation and opens undreamt of possibilities. 
When the firm was founded, one of our first important steps was to enlarge the 1 gram tablet, and here we already have an upgrade to our 100 gram block. And this block contains around 60 litres of ammonia, equivalent to the size of this balloon. And that's not all. The 100 gram block is going to be even bigger and be given a cartridge, making it suitable for use in cars. And now we've reached the point at which the system is mature. It can easily be integrated into vehicles. This cartridge has now been expanded for four kilograms of usable ammonia, equivalent to 6,000 litres of ammonia gas. That's equivalent to the balloon that Ulrich is just rolling up here. This balloon therefore contains enough ammonia gas to entirely neutralize another balloon of the same size filled with NOx. Meanwhile, the invention has been patented and further developed and has reached the production stage. Here, we're at the first stage of production. This is where the material that binds ammonia is added to the production. This sack contains one ton of salt, which will bind the ammonia later. It's a harmless white powder. The moment the salt reaches the pipes, there's no more daylight. This is a completely sealed system with high quality assurance. The next step in production is the drying process, in which the salt is freed from any moisture content it may have. The next step is the heart of the whole operation. The ammonia comes out of the tank and meets the salt. For the first time in this process. Inside this machine, the ammonia and the salt are quickly bound. After this process, the ammonia salt material moves on further into the cartridge. Now we come to the last part of the production line. Here, the container with the finished processed material is welded after it has been filled. Then a further leak test for quality assurance and the product is ready to leave the factory. Cartridges in bulk. And they've already been successfully launched in buses with diesel engines. Since the system requires little space, the buses can easily be retrofitted with it. A further benefit. We now have 300 buses driving through Copenhagen with clean exhaust emissions. We also have test vehicles stationed in London and have already started trials in the US. And there are test drives underway in Asia too. The results are outstanding. While previous systems to reduce pollution perform poorly in urban driving, the Danes invention reduces up to 99% of nitrogen oxides. That makes it the most CO2-friendly way to drastically reduce NOx emissions and meet future EU emission standards. But how does it work? In exhaust gas aftertreatment using the system, three areas are involved. The diesel engine, the ammonia cartridge, and the catalytic converter. Normally, nitrogen oxides reach the atmosphere almost unfiltered, until now. Via a sensor, the cartridge detects that the engine is heating up and it releases ammonia in a targeted manner. In the catalytic converter, the ammonia meets the NOx emissions. In a chemical reaction, ammonia and nitrogen oxides are converted into water and nitrogen. The harmless mixture leaves the exhaust as humid air. The system is not only extremely effective, but also extremely sustainable. The cartridges last for 10 years. They can be refilled hundreds of times over. This has potential to make a big impact on our air quality. It's important for us and our children. For me, being a father of two sons was also a big motivating factor. After the large diesel vehicles, Tue Johannessen's and Ulrich Quader's invention is now due to be developed for smaller vehicles. 
a technology for the environment and for humanity that clears the air and sets a whole new benchmark. Even if he doesn't have any more time for it today, Steve Lindsay hopes that one day he will return to racing. For more than 10 years, he was a racing driver and tested cars. During all that time, he was quite unaware that he was using a technological principle that would one day radically change his life. The engine of his car ignited a mixture of petrol and compressed air. A turbocharger on the engine used compressed air for added performance. And without compressed air, the tyres on his racing car could never have been inflated. In fact, our daily lives are full of applications that work with compressed air. And with compressors that produce it. I think compressors are really interesting because, to be honest, to begin with, I didn't know a great deal about compressors, like many people. And then I read somewhere that 10% of electricity that's used by industry within Europe, across all industry, goes into compressors. It's a fantastically high figure. And I realised that if you could make a difference to that, you could potentially make a, a big difference to energy usage across Europe. With clever engineering, Lindsay wants to design a new compressor. Above all, it should be more energy efficient. Lindsay studies patents and learns about the inventions of past decades. And then he realizes that to achieve his goal, he needs to think quite differently. The previous type of compressor, which is still in use, is the piston compressor. Here, an engine drives a piston inside a cylinder. When the piston slides downwards, air flows into the cylinder. When it is pushed upwards, the air is compressed, producing compressed air. The problem here, only half of the energy used produces compressed air. The compressor wastes the other half when it sucks air back in. Even though the principle has been continuously improved, there has not been a real breakthrough so far. Ours is the first new compression technology which is inherently oil-free, it leaks less, and so we have a unique combination of attributes which gives you a machine which is more efficient and, surprisingly, is cheaper to produce. To achieve this goal, Lindsay has to think long and hard. He knows that an energy-saving compressor would have to operate continuously in rotary motion and function better than anything else so far. It's long been recognised that rotary motion is good for compressors, but traditional rotary compressors suffer very badly with sealing where they seal along a single line. Our geometry uniquely allows you to seal across a broad area, and this gives you a lot less internal leakage, which gives you a more efficient machine, but also a machine that you can run oil-free, and a machine, if you choose, you can run more slowly for long reliability. Steve Lindsay hires a small team of engineers. The inventor writes his own software, which enables him to virtually design and test his idea. After hundreds of tests and calculations, the design of the new compressor is finally ready. The originally straight cylinder of the piston compressor becomes a circular tube, resembling a donut. The piston inside becomes a blade that rotates continuously. Behind the blade, air is constantly sucked in. As soon as the blade passes the suction opening, a rotating disc blocks the circular cylinder. Now all the air is compressed in front of the blade until it is released through a valve. The blade slips through the slot in the rotating disc again and compresses the next load of air. The compressor sucks air in and compresses it simultaneously. After we'd built a number of virtual prototypes, our first real-world application went into the Worcester Wastewater Plant, a real site in Seven Trent Water in the UK. 
And there it ran and showed an astonishing 21% reduction in electricity usage, a true step change in energy usage from a relatively simple change. In future, Steve Lindsay wants to license the patented technology with his company, Lontra. But he also wants to make compressors himself. Several new prototypes are already being tested. More will follow. Basically, there are no limits to the use of Lindsay's blade compressors. I think the exciting thing about compressors is that they're behind nearly every part of modern life from the compressor that opens the doors on a train or a bus, to the compressors that power the tools in factories or power the spray guns in factories, to compressors in air conditioning or in the back of your fridge. And our compressor can potentially replace all of them over time. Steve Lindsay estimates that the blade compressor could save approximately two terawatt hours of energy in Europe every year. The consumption equivalent of a city with 200,000 inhabitants. If he has success with his compressor, he'll probably take time off to do a few more laps on the circuit. Then he can indulge in wasting a bit of energy again too. Music means a great deal to me. Listening to music clears my head, so that afterwards I can tackle technology again with new thoughts. Anton van Zanten is an engineer. And He's one of the greatest inventors in the field of road safety. He invented the brake that thinks and also steers whenever necessary, ESP, the Electronic Stability Program. Even during his doctorate in the US in 1973, the Dutchman was concerned with vehicle safety. In 1977, at Bosch in Stuttgart, he played a major role in establishing the anti-lock braking system, ABS, his next big goal, the development of a dynamic and intelligent stability program for vehicles. But to do this, Van Zanten's team first had to create the electronic preconditions. In a panic situation, can electronics respond faster and above all more intelligently than a human brain? How can valves autonomously generate brake pressure without the driver himself decelerating? These were the main questions that Van Zanten had to answer. All his life, the engineer has been fascinated by the concept of braking safety, and that's probably what makes him so special. You only become an inventor when you're not satisfied. When you're satisfied with everything, you have no urge to create anything new. Van Zanten was dissatisfied with the limitations of ABS. In particular, vehicles with a higher center of gravity have a serious drawback. During any sudden evasive maneuver, this vehicle design skids easily and flips over. One well-known upset in this regard was a model from Mercedes, which, like this test vehicle, had a higher center of gravity. This was the turning point for Van Zanten's invention. The A-Class flipping over back then was a big stroke of luck for Bosch and for road safety, because ESP then became standard. Instead of taking the vehicle off the market, Mercedes integrated ESP into it as standard. There were no more upsets. Since 2014, ESP has been compulsory in all new vehicles in Europe. On the test track in Malmsheim near Stuttgart, Anton van Zanten is reminded of some memories. On the old airport site during the early 1980s, he did the first test drives for ESP with his team. And they used a system that was entirely new at that time, a computer. It weighed 15 kilos and took up the entire passenger seat. And here's how ESP works. 
All the wheels, the center of the vehicle, and the steering wheel are equipped with sensors. The data are collected in a control unit at the front. In this evasive maneuver, the driver jerks the steering wheel to the left. But instead of going left according to the wheel position, the car carries straight on towards the obstacle. The sensors on the steering and in the middle of the car have noticed the difference right away. The control unit of the ESP reacts instantly. It breaks the left rear tire and generates the necessary counterforce without the driver having to do anything at all. Steering in the opposite direction after an evasive maneuver can also have fatal consequences. The tail of the vehicle loses traction. The car begins to skid and, in the worst case, it spins. Before that happens, ESP briefly breaks the left front wheel. It comes back on track and remains stable. The result has been phenomenal. 45% fewer fatalities due to the intelligent braking system. The next step, autonomous assistance systems that help the driver in extreme situations or even take over control of the vehicle completely. Today's driving safety technology would be inconceivable without Van Zanten's pioneering work. That makes the inventor proud. ESP has cost the company a lot of money, but it's been worth it. It's become a market success, and it saves a great many lives. A life's work devoted to the safety of millions of road users. The story starts in 2004, in a restaurant in Washington. Scientists from Europe have traveled here to talk with their American colleagues about the future of European satellite navigation. But the negotiations are a failure for the Europeans. That same evening, they discuss what to do next. From the start, we wanted to find signals that would still be valid 20 years into the future. Our ambition was to develop a navigation system that could be used for many decades, a system that wasn't just as good as GPS, but even better. José Ángel Avila Rodríguez, together with Laurent Lestarqui, Jean-Luc Isler, Lionel Ries and Günther Hein, all search for a solution. That evening, they turned the restaurant into a laboratory, full of modulation technology. Nothing less than the future of one of Europe's biggest technology projects lies in their hands. The five researchers have to ensure that Europe can build its own system of satellite navigation in orbit, Galileo. Their mission is to develop a technology that will make Europe independent of American GPS. Galileo is also expected to provide more precise position data than the American system. What's still missing is a signal that can transmit 10 different navigation codes at the same time. The problem is that the authorized transmission frequencies are already almost filled up by the GPS signal. Receivers on Earth such as sat-nav devices in cars, can use the data from the satellite signals to calculate their positions and plot routes. And here, the more precise the information transmitted by the satellites, the better. It has to contain data on the position of each individual satellite, for instance. And the number of satellites is also very important. To determine your position, you need to have four Galileo satellites in view at the same time. That gives you latitude, longitude and altitude, and also the receiver's time. Atomic clocks on the satellites ensure precise time measurement. This data also has to be sent via the satellite signal. 
because the receiver uses the time stamp to calculate how far the signal traveled and hence its own position on Earth. The telecommunications experts need to find a way to store this information, which is needed for navigation, inside the Galileo signal and to make it powerful and stable alongside the GPS signal. There were three important criteria to be considered. First, we needed compatibility with the other satellite navigation systems. We had to share the same transmission frequencies without causing interference with them. Secondly, the systems had to be able to work together. And thirdly, there was the performance of the Galileo signal itself. To avoid transmission errors and to get high performance out of their signal at the same time, the researchers rely on a complex procedure known as coded modulation. The advantage here is that information and data can be integrated in such a way that other signals on the same frequency cause no interference. They successfully managed to do this by modulating their new signal between the existing GPS signals. The performance of their own signal suddenly increases, improving so much that even the scientists are surprised at their own success. With their Galileo signal, they have made huge progress researching into the digital waveforms known as BOC. BOC signals, meaning binary offset carrier signals, are waveforms that enable more precise positioning while still having a spectrum that allows compatibility with other satellite navigation systems. Galileo has been in operation since the end of 2016, transmitting the modulation researchers' special signal waves, which are far more precise and stable than those of the other systems. The signals travel more than 20,000 kilometers, and the researchers receive them in the lab as noise, which initially seems hard to define. They filter the clear code of their signal out of the noise. And this makes positioning with Galileo accurate to within a few centimeters. In this way, the researchers have created a basis for all kinds of ideas and applications. For a service reserved exclusively for rescue, for instance. Experts estimate the economic success of the European satellite navigation system at more than 90 billion euros. For example, developers of the Bike Citizens app for cycling through cities rely on Galileo signals. And in agriculture, crop protection products can be used far more precisely and economically, thanks to the exact signals from the satellites. At first, no one expected the kind of performance we've achieved, especially the Americans, who were very surprised at our unimaginable discovery. Today, with their solutions for satellite navigation, the five scientists are regarded as the artists par excellence among signal wave modulation researchers. When it comes to the right sound and how it can be recorded and transmitted, this man is in a league of his own. Lars Lillerud is an entrepreneur, an autodidact and a musician. He's also contributed good vibrations to the digitization of sound. I've invented SBR technology, or spectral band replication, which improves sound codes like MP3 and AAC and increases the effectiveness of the coding by about 50%. This is what the world has been waiting for. Since the 1990s, the digitization of sound has been a big issue because people need digital sound on mobile phones, digital radio, and the music services on the internet.
since audio documents are large but the transmission rates have to remain low, the audio data is compressed. This is already happening over the phone. These so-called codecs, such as MP3 or AAC, remove information at high and low frequencies. However, with increasing compression, the sound quality starts to suffer at some point. This technology was soon considered to have reached its limits. Experts believed that it couldn't be developed any further. After the that man had uh... After the AAC sound code was developed, experts felt that it had reached its maximum. And I thought they were rather locked in traditional thinking. Then I got the idea of reducing frequency redundancy in a new way. That was the foundation for this solution, SBR. The basic idea behind Lars Liljerud's concept of spectral band replication, or SBR, makes use of two phenomena, sound and human hearing. In most cases, we don't hear a pure tone, but rather a sound mixture, a sound composed of many partial tones. The deepest of these partial tones is the fundamental tone. On top of this are the so-called overtones. Their frequencies can be calculated from the frequency of the fundamental tone. The predictability of overtones, the fact that they can be calculated, is the basis for Lars Liljerud's idea for an entirely new kind of sound compression. The way SBR works is that instead of transmitting all of the frequency information, you only transmit the lower frequencies. Then, on the listener's side, you restore the higher frequencies again. Each fundamental tone on, say, a trumpet or a violin or a human voice contains information about the entire vocal spectrum. So, you only have to transmit the lower fundamental tones and then artificially restore the upper frequencies at the receiving end. With the help of the telecommunications engineers Christopher Schurling and Per Ekstrand, Lars Lillerud succeeds in making his idea workable. In 1997, he registers the first patent. Those are only the fundamental tones. And here, you can enjoy the SBR sounds. That's the $250 million trick. Here, we combine both of them. The science behind sound encoding is characterized by being very traditional. I had a different angle on the problem. That led to me being regarded as someone who wanted to introduce a disruptive technology into traditional thinking. The Swedish inventor's concept is in demand, however. In 2007, the world-famous audio engineering company Dolby bought his company, which he had founded together with the Fraunhofer Institute in Erlangen, for the amazing price of $250 million. My original thought was a technology that would be a kind of turbo, which could be added to existing encoders such as MP3 or AAC so as to improve their performance. The business model was to sell these turbo units to sound code manufacturers. The plan turned out differently. Today, Lars Liljerud's technology has been licensed by Dolby worldwide. Experts estimate that SBR is now being used for over 6 billion devices and applications. In mobile phones, PCs, apps, and on radio stations. With his invention, the crazy outsider, as he calls himself, has revolutionized the transmission of digitized sound.
uncomplicated, fast, wireless, and above all, mobile. We can no longer imagine life without a constant internet connection and data transfer. Wi-Fi and 4G LTE mobile networks give us this freedom. Good evening, how are you? How's Chennai? It's warm and humid here. Good. So, uh, it was a busy day yesterday, so hopefully it was going to be pretty busy today also. What but time are they wrapping up this evening? I think by about 5 o'clock. I just made a Skype call to my wife at Chennai, India, about 14,000 kilometers away from my mobile phone. And this amazing possibility was en enabled by an idea I had some years ago. The first mobile phone with internet capability came out on the market in the late 90s. But with this generation of smartphones, sending large amounts of data, such as photos or videos, was still extremely slow. It was the electrical engineer Arogya Swami Paul Raj who changed all that. Thanks to his invention, there is a mobile technology today that can not only shift data far more quickly, but also in larger quantities. The beginning of a new age in modern communication. It was his pioneering spirit and, as so often, a lucky coincidence that first made his brilliant invention possible. Born in 1944 in Polachi, southern India, at the age of just 15, he joined the Indian Navy, where he trained as an electrical engineer. And after my initial training, I was pulled into building sonar systems for the Indian Navy. I began to understand how to use antenna rays for detection of submarines, submarine detection. So that gave me a lot of background of using antenna rays. In 1991, after 25 years in the Indian Navy, Paul Raj moved with his family to California to do research at Stanford University. And here, he was able to make direct use of his multi-antenna systems know-how. His first assignment was to solve a problem for the US Air Force. The idea there was an aircraft flying at very high altitude, looking at enemy radios on the ground and to trying to listen to them. It turns out at, at very high levels of an aircraft, uh, many of these radios on the same frequency channel cannot be listened to without, with a single receiver. You need an antenna array to make this happen. With an antenna array, the radio signals can be separated and received individually. To do this, Paul Raj had to rewrite the existing algorithm of the computer program. But how? The engineer took two students and simulated the situation faced by the Air Force project on campus. He used two 900 megahertz telephones to simulate the enemy radio stations. One frequency, two signals. He also set up a base station with two antennas. Now, he only had to adapt the algorithm so that the signals would not interfere with each other. Of course, it worked well outside, as long as the users were well separated. But when they came close, it would not separate, and that was expected. And then one day, we had some rain. The rain forced them to move the experiment indoors. This was the turning point of his research. And I did this inside a foyer of this building. And now, when the signals users were well separated, it worked very well. But to my great surprise, it also worked well when they were closely separated. When the two men stood side by side, there was no interference. Theoretically impossible, because normally the signals would be expected to interfere at the same frequency. But inside the building, they suddenly stopped doing that. So the question was, how did that happen? Then I realized that the signals emanating from the two phones next to each other were bouncing off the walls, called scattering, and that induces different signatures at the antenna array. And therefore, the array was able to separate signals from closely, support, closely located transmitters. The alignment of the signals had changed, and as a result, had canceled out the interference. By bouncing off the walls, they had shifted minimally and could now be captured by the antenna base station. Two days later, at the hairdresser, Paul Raj had the decisive idea. Uh, while having a haircut, 
I realized that if uh, we can then convert this, this physical phenomena to be able to send multiple streams from a single phone to a base station and actually increase the throughput of the system. And the throughput will be multiplied by the number of antennas at the transmitter and the number of antennas at the receiver. And that was the birth of the MIMO concept. MIMO means multiple input, multiple output. Instead of just one antenna as before, several, or at least two antennas, are mounted on the transmitter as well as on the receiver, for example, in a smartphone. The transmitter antennas first split up the data and transmit them to a base station. Since the radio signals collide with obstacles, such as trees or houses, their directions change. As a result, they are offset when they arrive at the receiver's antenna, so there is no interference. The receiver recomposes the signals and the data are complete. So once you have a, a two by two system, you get twice the throughput, four by four system, four times the throughput. So in cellular communications or in Wi-Fi, spectrum is very, very limited. And therefore, if you have multiple antennas, you can increase the speed of the link and uh, so MIMO has become an essential part of all broadband wireless communications. MIMO lies at the heart of wireless networks and will also be a part of the 5G network planned for 2020. Arogya Swami Paul Raj has already changed the lives of billions of people and will continue to do so in the future. Environmental pollution and climate change. 20 years ago, neither seemed much of a threat. And so Gert-Jan Gruter had no qualms about thinking of ways to use crude oil in the production of plastic. For bottles, packagings and textiles. Throughout his career, the Dutchman has had dealings with all the global players in the chemical industry and has also witnessed what is being done to this planet. So he made a decision. Nowadays, 300 million tonnes of plastic are being used worldwide, and the volume will quadruple over the next 30 years to more than 1 billion tonnes. To make the transition from fossil fuels to sustainable plastics, we have to rely on biomass. But for this, we need new materials. That's the only way to bring about this change. Up until that moment, Gert-Jan Gruter had been solving chemical problems on behalf of customers in his company Avantium. But this time, he decided to do research on his own account. He wanted to continue making plastic, but quite differently from how it was currently being made. His idea, a plant-based plastic, 100% renewable. His vision centered on the chemical conversion of plant sugar, that is, starch. From it, theoretically, the raw material for plastic, furan dicarboxylic acid, or FDCA for short, could be made. The only problem, producing FDCA in large quantities is far from simple. In, in the last uh, 100 years, there are more than 1,000... Over the past 100 years, more than 1,000 publications and patents have been published on FDCA. Ultimately, however, neither research nor any of these patents have resulted in a viable method of producing this material in large quantities and at competitive prices. To make FDCA, two synthetic steps are required. In the first step, certain building blocks are produced from the starch of maize and grain. Then, in the second step, FDCA can be made from these blocks. The problem was that, until then, the first step had only been tried in water. And in water, the building blocks for the FDCA are not stable. Without these blocks, no FDCA. So Gruter's idea was to use alcohol instead of water. However, that presented his team with a further challenge. The big problem for us at first was that only 1% of sugar can be dissolved in alcohol. 
But we finally found a way to dissolve much more sugar in alcohol, 30% more, without any additional stages or extra costs. And that was the decisive step towards a commercially viable process. And that was uiteindelijk the the belangrijkste step stap om tot een commercieel proces te komen. Gert Jan Gruter's invention has led to the creation of an entirely new technology platform. He has named it ICSI. In a pilot plant, the production of FDCA is currently being tested on a large scale. The plant sugar still comes from maize and grain, but should soon also come from grass, wood, and vegetable waste. From the FDCA in the plant, a plastic granulate is finally produced. The chemists refer to it as PEF. Bottles, foils and textile fibers can all be easily produced from it. A plant-based plastic, 100% renewable. And a further sensation, PEF actually has far better properties than those of PET. When we managed to produce PEF for the first time, we also made the first bottle. And the bottle turned out to have extraordinary characteristics. It was very hard for oxygen to get in and for carbonic acid from soft drinks to get out. So we saw that this packaging material, PEF, prolongs the shelf life of food and is more resistant. Uh, All of that makes this plant-based plastic a material for the future. And this all by elkaar makes it a geweldig plastic material for the toekomst. Coca-Cola, Danone and Alpla, the world's largest producer of plastic bottles, are already cooperating with Gruter. Shortly after its initial public offering in March 2017, his company Avantium was worth almost 300 million euros. The global market for plastic bottles is currently worth about 35 billion euros. Thanks to patents on the ICSI technology, this will also be worthwhile for Gruter's company. Above all, however, the environment will benefit from this invention. Making this green plastic produces 70% less CO2 and consumes 70% less energy than the production of fossil plastics. So, this makes the CO2 footprint of the plastic quite small. Gert Jan Gruter is certainly making his mark on the way towards a sustainable future for us all. Oil is the fuel of our world. 95 million barrels of it are consumed daily. That's over 15 billion liters. The so-called black gold can easily become poisonous, however. If it reaches the environment unhindered, as it did here in the 2010 disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, nature suffers serious damage. A small company from Saxony-Anhalt could be of assistance here. The company Doirex currently manufactures waxes for paints and varnishes. New to its product range, a mysterious wax cotton that adsorbs oil from water. Just how well it does so is demonstrated by the chemist Ernst Krendlinger. We just have to move things around a bit for the oil to bind all over the cotton. And then, with just one movement, you can get the oil out again and the water is clean once more. In this way, polluted water becomes drinking water again. But where does the wax cotton get its astonishing properties from? As with so many inventions, the story of this discovery began quite by chance. In spring 2010, an employee made a mistake. He incorrectly adjusted a machine, having confused the values for pressure and temperature. Production continued overnight. The next morning, his boss, Günther Hufschmidt, was thunderstruck by the sight that greeted him. This one, it was pure chaos. The product looked odd 
It was incredibly bulky. And my first thought was, is the machine broken? Is the spraying system still working? That was my first reaction. 10 tons of useless wax cotton. What could be done with it? Hufschmidt didn't want to waste anything just yet, which in retrospect was a stroke of luck. Around the same time, the images of the Gulf of Mexico oil disaster, in which 11 people died, were broadcast around the world. There were discussions about how the oil could be removed from the sea, and this gave Günther Hufschmidt an idea. Four weeks later, I was watching TV with my children, and that was when the oil disaster in the Gulf of Mexico occurred, and the whole world started wondering about how to recover the oil from the sea and how to save the ocean. And that was when I called Dr. Krendlinger and asked him, could you briefly check whether the wax cotton absorbs oil? It wasn't such a far-fetched idea. After all, the fluffy wax cotton did resemble a sponge, and it had also demonstrated amazing properties in the lab. Like oil, the substance is hydrophobic and floats on the water surface. Measurements of its adsorbency had shown that just one kilogram was enough to absorb six litres of oil, one third more than most other oil binders manage. Then lumps formed that were very easy to fish out of the water again. This was also an advantage over many other binders that exist only in powder form. The secret behind the wax cotton's performance is its structure. It has an extremely large surface area, which means it's incredibly branched. There are lots of fibers in the nanometer range, and these fibers cause a capillary effect, and the highly viscous oil is absorbed. The fibers continue branching out all the way into the nano range. This creates a huge surface on which the oil molecules accumulate. They adhere to the surface because of a physical force, so-called adsorption. This is just like when two glass plates are stuck together by a thin layer of water. In this case, the glass and water do not bind, such that, unlike with a chemical adhesive, there is no residue when the plates are torn apart again. Hufschmidt applies for a patent for his invention. The miraculous white wax cotton is named Pure. The first buyers are soon found. Currently, our biggest success is the application in wind turbines. Wind turbines lose oil constantly. A channel containing the wax cotton traps the oil but lets rainwater through. So, the ring does not have to be pumped out after every rain shower. And the wax cotton has already been shipped overseas as well. Together with the relief organization One Earth, One Ocean, Doirex supplies the product to Africa for the cleaning of polluted streams and lakes. Hufschmidt believes that production halls could soon be created worldwide. It would even be possible to produce directly on board ships. We have a very simple idea, that these production facilities for Pure can be set up decentrally in any location, on land, but also on every ship. And the vision of putting such a production plant on a ship and distributing pure across the world's polluted oceans, that would be my goal and my dream. Even though pure cannot prevent oil spills, in the future it could effectively limit the destructive effects of major oil disasters. Archimedes was a really bright guy. Over 2,000 years ago, the old Sicilian already figured out why things float on water. My duck, for example. It doesn't sink because the amount of water it's displacing is much heavier than it is. And that's what provides buoyancy. OK, it all sounds logical enough, but sometimes the physics of water is really paradoxical. For example, here, in these two containers, the amount of water in the left one is greater than in the right one. 
nevertheless, the pressure exerted by the water on the bottoms of the two containers is absolutely equal. The pressure depends solely on the height of the water level, not on the amount of water. Initially, this seems totally irrational. Some of these paradoxes have long been known, and recently, one more joined the list. One familiar to everybody. At first, the water flows straight towards the drain, but then, suddenly, a whirlpool forms. The physics behind it is still a mystery today. Actually, this phenomenon was studied in more detail only a few years ago by a Czech engineer, and he transformed it into something astonishing. The Charles Bridge in Prague is a perfect place to look down on the waters of the Vltava River. Miroslav Sedlacek had already seen lots of whirlpools in the river, but he'd never really thought about the physics involved, until the day he noticed strange phenomena in these water eddies. I observed that inside the eddies, floating objects, like leaves, do move along with the current. But if they're located on the edge of a water vortex, they also rotate counter to the flow of the vortex, around their own axis. I found that fascinating and mysterious. I tried to analyze the observations and organize them in my head. And that's how I began to devote myself to this principle. The Czech engineer could not get the phenomenon out of his mind. He sensed that his discovery could be a source of energy generation, of an entirely new kind. So he tried to gain support from the highest level, from the rector of the Technical University. I was surprised and thought that with the observation Miro Sedlacek made, there could be new perspectives for future energy supply, a source of renewable energy that could fundamentally change the way we think about energy generation. Together with his colleagues Jiriji Novak and Václav Beran, Sedlacek tried to explain the phenomenon mathematically. It was difficult, however, and he was not entirely successful. But clearly, the scientists were on the track of a new hydrodynamic principle. With little technology and only minor interventions in nature, it allows to convert the energy of water into electrical energy. This new hydrodynamic principle is simple. It means we can take advantage of the power of water by simple means, and also that the ecology of a natural watercourse will not be disturbed. We can produce energy that is absolutely clean ecologically. And something else became clear. The principle already works with very small amounts of water and low flow rates. That means energy can be generated in streams or even canals, something impossible with conventional technology. Using just one system in a stream can probably generate enough electricity for three to four households. All considerations and calculations made it clear that the principle should work. Putting theory into practice, however, is not easy. It involves countless trials and setbacks. But finally, a prototype was found. Sedlacek discovered that the turbine shaft, the stator, had to be of a certain shape. And between the wall of the stator and the rotor, marked here in red, there could only be a small gap. Only then did the water flowing through trigger a movement in the rotor that was very hard to stop. Rolling fluid turbine is the name Sedlacek has given to his invention. He's patented it in Europe and the US. The reason the turbine works is that the rotor rolls inside the stator. That's why the principle is called the rolling principle. The rotor rolls along the edge of the stator and simultaneously rotates counter to the direction of roll, around its own axis. So, water flows through the turbine shaft 
and through a narrow opening, passing the rotor. Below, it swirls up. The flow of the water sets the rotor in motion. It rolls in a circle inside the stator and simultaneously counter-rotates around its own axis. The two movements enable energy to be produced via a generator. One hour's drive away from Prague, Miroslav Sedlacek has set up a showroom. It contains a more recent prototype of the rolling fluid turbine. The technology not only functions on weirs, small rivers and streams, but also in irrigation canals and pipelines. And the invention is already being sold in America, where it's being used at sea in a marine current power station. Miroslav Sedlacek is proud of his invention. The technology is ready to conquer the world. Most importantly, it could be useful in remote areas and in developing countries. Objevení nového hydrodynamického principu, na kterém turbinka pracuje. The discovery of this new hydraulic principle gives me personally a very good feeling. Because I'm quite convinced it can help people who, until now, have had no access to electrical energy or to energy from hydropower. So far, the physics of the new hydrodynamic principle is puzzling. Sedlacek discovered it, but neither he nor anyone else has been fully able to explain it just yet. Who knows, things may even stay that way for a while. But in the meantime, the new turbines will already have generated a great deal of electricity. Paying with a credit or debit card. What is everyday life for millions of people is based on encrypted communication and is meant to guarantee safety. The pin unlocks the card. Only then can the tiny microprocessor inside communicate with the card reader and the bank's computers. The principle behind this application is known as two-factor authentication and is also used in mobile telephony. To unlock, you need two elements, the pin and the phone with the smart card. Even a fingerprint or an iris scan can unlock devices or grant access to a building in combination with an electronic ID card. Online transfers often require a password and an additional transaction number sent to the phone as a text message. So two independent elements are always needed to carry out an application. The small town of Rousset in southern France. Here at the semiconductor manufacturer ST Microelectronics, experts are working on making smart cards and microprocessors even safer. Pierre-Yvon Liardet and Johan Damon are among the world's leading data encryption specialists. Cryptography, as this specialist field is known, is based on teamwork. It's only on a team basis that the best solutions can be found. Alice. It's always about making communication between transmitter and receiver, which can be people or devices, unreadable for outsiders. The more complex the encryption, the more cryptography seems to be a secret science. It's really like working, working. And then at some point, there's some kind of, aha, you see, this is what we could do. And then this simple idea you can put into practice. But to get to that simple idea, you have to go through a lot of wrong dead ends, let's say. Also with this known encryption, only one variable remains secret, the key for the specific application. The underlying method, however, has been published. But what makes the function complex is that you do this 10 times. And it's called advanced encryption standard. I think it's used all over the world. AES is even approved in the USA for the encryption of government documents. The clean room at ST Microelectronics 
production site of the smart cards on which encryptions often run in everyday life. Silicon wafers are the base material for the microscopically small circuits. Work is done in protective suits to prevent even the smallest speck of dust from affecting production. The result? Miniature technical marvels, which even present the cryptographers with special challenges. So for instance, if you want to make um, a payment on a bus, huh? a contactless payment, so you just hold your card, that's 200 milliseconds. In this 200 milliseconds, you must exchange data and you must do a cryptographic computation. But there's an addi additional uh, constraint. On this smart card, it doesn't have a battery. So it gets its energy from an electromagnetic field. So there's an antenna built into the smart card, but that means that your cryptography cannot consume too much energy, otherwise it wouldn't work. So these are all restrictions, and that puts a lot of challenges on people developing these cards. The high security module, a type of severely restricted server. This is where probably the most important step in smart card production is carried out. The computer encrypts each smart card individually for its future user. The highest security level already applies, but experts have succeeded in making abuse of the HSM even more difficult. For this purpose, the smart card blanks are already programmed with a provisional identifier in advance. This can be retrieved only once by the HSM before the smart card overwrites it. Otherwise, with its master key, it could access already individualized smart cards later. Clones of the cards could be made and used for criminal purposes. Although their encryption is considered secure, it is also part of cryptographers' daily work to detect possible weak points themselves. This is referred to as ethical hacking. This is the only way that Johan Damon and his colleagues can repeatedly forestall cyber criminals. Change recently. Oh. We send the chips to Pierre Yvon, who will then try to attack it. If we did our job right from the start, they will not find anything, but most of the time they find something. It is a teamwork that we always uh, pushing uh, the wheel, try to attack, succeed to attack, uh, give feedback to the designer, and again make attack, uh, provide a result to the designer until we get something that is uh, resistant uh, to everything that we know. Cybercrime and data theft have long ceased to be abstract threats. Credit card fraud causes 1.5 billion euros worth of damage each year in the EU alone. Add to that our increasingly networked everyday life, in which we're growing increasingly dependent on electronic communication. It's only when those applications are securely encrypted that we are protected from hackers and know that only people we trust will be able to read and use our data. Our world is full of it. We use it to save and transmit information. We pack with it and pay with it. We're in contact with the material every minute of our lives. Life without paper, almost inconceivable. It's hard to imagine that this 2,000-year-old material will soon be revolutionizing our lives yet again. Because paper won't remain just paper. It's going to be transformed into an electronic medium with completely new, undreamt of capabilities and features. She started this revolution, Elvira Fortunato from the University of Lisbon. 
I'm an engineer, and so I enjoy expanding the use of materials, manipulating them a little, so they can be used for quite different purposes. For the Portuguese materials researcher, it all began during a discussion with her team. Her husband, Rodrigo Martins, was there too. Together, they were seeking ways of attaching electronic circuits to flexible surfaces. Since the paper is a biopolymer and also a flexible material, we came up with the idea of using paper as a carrier for transistors and electronic circuits. That functioned very well, as it turned out. But then, Elvira Fortunato came up with a further crucial idea. Why should paper merely be the carrier material for electronic circuits? It could also be an electronic component in itself. Since we knew that paper had an insulating effect, we wondered whether it could also be used as an active element within a transistor. Every microchip in our electronic devices contains millions of transistors. They function like switches. If there is current, the transistor switches to on, and current can flow. For the transistor to work in this way, one component is indispensable, an insulating layer, located between its electrical connections. In conventional chips, it consists of pure silicon. That is exactly what Elvira Fortunato wanted to replace in her new transistors. She asked a member of her team to put the theory into practice. He attached the switching element of a transistor onto a small section of paper. And, lo and behold, the moment the voltage was switched on, current flowed. The paper transistor worked. I must say, I thought there was a very low probability that a transistor made of paper would work. My colleague made the transistor, and straight after the first attempt, he said, look, it works. We were really happy here in the lab to be the first people in the world to create something that was new and innovative. Encouraged by their initial success, the researchers adapted an inkjet printer in their lab. Instead of using ink, the printer now prints the electronic components of a transistor onto the paper. Meanwhile, the team led by Elvira Fortunato has produced many different paper transistors in this way at the laboratories of the new University of Lisbon. Individual electronic applications, sheet by sheet. These include biosensors for basic medical tests or circuits that render invisible images on paper suddenly visible. Solar cells on paper are also possible. They generate current even in artificial light. Of course, when we talk about electronic paper, it certainly won't replace everything that's being done with silicon technology today. But electronic paper will be used in addition to the existing technologies, for applications that cost little and need to be produced in large quantities. In a future supermarket, therefore, we might encounter packaging that displays changing prices or other information. The Internet of Things is getting closer. The energy comes from solar cells in the paper. Visiting cards, when touched, could show texts and images, or switch to any desired language. And in newspapers, advertisements or graphics could actually move. The greatest benefit when using paper in the electronic sector is the fact that it's renewable. It's also a flexible material. The costs are low and the material is already there. Paper doesn't need to be newly invented. The variety of products with paper transistors is seemingly endless because the properties of paper, its structure, size, and the nature of the fibers or minerals contained inside it 
can all influence the applications. Elvira Fortunato's team is in the process of exploring these relationships. Meanwhile, research into electronic paper continues worldwide. But Elvira Fortunato has the patent on this technology. The brave new world of paper electronics is going to revolutionize our daily lives. Sometime in the future, after landing on the moon, mankind finally wants to take the next big step and conquer the solar system. Ten astronauts set out on the journey to the red planet. The outbound journey alone takes six months. Six months in zero gravity. A journey which, alongside numerous other challenges, can only take place if a very specific medical problem can be controlled. The present day, following a traffic accident, a patient is admitted to the emergency room. Doctors suspect that she has suffered severe traumatic brain injury. It's a life-threatening situation. If bleeding or swelling occurs inside the head, pressure within the skull increases rapidly. Until now, there's been only one method of measuring pressure in the skull reliably. The skull is drilled open and a pressure gauge is implanted five centimeters inside the patient's head in the so-called ventricular interior. This probe has a connection to the outside and remains in the patient's skull. For the doctors, it's the only way to continuously monitor the intracranial pressure, to measure any pressure changes in the brain, and to provide a targeted therapeutic response. This being the right medication or emergency surgery. The fact is that drilling into the skull used to be the only reliable technique for determining intracranial pressure. No longer. The University of Kaunas in Lithuania. A man working here claims that the skull no longer needs to be drilled for pressure in the skull to be measured. Arminas Ragauskas has found an entirely different solution based on a technology that everyone knows, blood pressure measurement. The principle is as painless as it is simple. For measuring blood pressure in the body, an artery in the arm is initially blocked by inflating a cuff. Then the pressure is slowly reduced, precisely until the moment the blood pressure of the body is exactly the same as the external pressure. The blood flows back the doctor listens to the pulse in the artery and can now read off the exact blood pressure. How to indicate the balance, how to understand where, where the balance is. In this case, uh, some microphone or spigma manometer is used uh, just to listen what noises are in the artery. This principle cannot be applied for measurement of the pressure in the brain. Uh, why? Because uh, we have rigid skull. Instead, you can look inside the skull using ultrasound. At the heart of Ragauskas's new intracranial pressure measuring device is a very special pair of glasses. They're not only airtight when closed, but also have an ultrasonic probe integrated into them. And by an air hose, air pressure on the eye can be gradually increased. What's it all for? The principle behind it was a stroke of genius. During measurement, the ultrasound focuses on the ophthalmic artery. This vessel has a special feature. One part of it lies within the skull and the other outside it, directly on the eye. Ideal for Ragauskas. If there's a dangerous increase in pressure within the skull, the ophthalmic artery is squeezed more and more. As a result, the blood in its inner part flows faster than in the outer one. To determine this inner pressure, the pressure on the outer part only has to be increased until the blood flows at the same speed again in both. That is, that the external pressure is exactly the same as the internal pressure. Sounds rather familiar. Somehow very close to the principle of non-invasive arterial blood pressure measurement. But uh, 
In the case of arterial blood pressure measurement, you are, you are closing artery. Here we are just a little bit changing the diameter of ophthalmic artery in order to find the balance. Compressed air on the eye sounds painful, but in fact, the pressure exerted by the device on the eye is as minimal as water pressure at a depth of only 70 centimeters. This is not a full depth of your bath in, in your residence place. That means nothing, no, no, no injury here. And if you will think about the flight, if the plane is, is taking uh, heat, uh, in this case, pressure in, inside the cabin is changing in much, much wider interval and no injuries. This is safe procedure. High tech that looks good and, most importantly, doesn't hurt anyone. Arminas Ragauskas' invention originated at a time when the University of Kaunas still looked different from today. Collapse of Soviet Union. I was working for, for uh, some, uh, let us say, aerospace industry in Soviet Union as a scientist, as an engineer, uh, staying, of course, in Lithuania. And uh, during one night, all, all customers disappeared. What to do after that? It was a blow of fate that finally got Ragauskas going. Unfortunately, my mother passed away in, in neurosurgical intensive care unit. I saw that a lot of technological problems in neurointensive care unit can be solved. And uh, fortunately, in my lab, I had uh, our own patented devices for very different industrial applications, ultrasonic devices, which were unique and very sensitive. And it was possible to think about medical application. Out of space, Rogowskis' first subject of study is now his future too. His technology is going to be tested in zero gravity. The reason? A phenomenon exists in space travel that continues to totally puzzle scientists. After one to two weeks of weightlessness, 60% of all astronauts slowly go blind. Scientists believe the cause is located inside the astronaut's skulls and is connected to intracranial pressure. Rogowskis' technology will make it possible in the near future to achieve something impossible up to now, to measure an astronaut's intracranial pressure on a space station in orbit without having to drill open their skull. This syndrome is uh, not manageable at the moment, and NASA and other agencies which are interested in long-term flights, they're interested to understand the syndrome. Can you imagine invasive ICP measurement in the space? That's impossible. Astronaut is very expensive specialty. His invention should provide the key to solving the problem for the astronauts. It could be even uh, the decision making about suitability of this organism, this person, to long term flight. Now, nobody can simply select who will fly without this syndrome and who will fly with this syndrome. One thing is certain a manned trip to Mars will only be properly feasible if it has been previously ensured that six out of 10 astronauts will not reach the red planet almost blind. And traumatic brain injury patients worldwide will certainly be able to benefit from Rogowskis' invention very soon. Savoring food. Almost everywhere in the world, this is what Italian cuisine stands for. And where would it be without wheat? Wheat is not only the base ingredient of pasta, but also many kinds of bread or pastries. Whether crunchy or crispy, the reason we love products made from wheat flour so much is mainly due to the gluten they contain. The gluten makes for a special consistency and is also contained in many other grains, such as barley, spelt, and rye. But not everyone can tolerate gluten. Around 1% of people are allergic to it. And those are precisely the people this woman wants to help. Food technologist Vienna Czerny has researched into gluten for 20 years. 
Food is a sensory experience. We wanted people to still enjoy their food, even if they've had to give up gluten. Vienna Czerny's goal is to find a quality replacement for gluten. It's a major challenge because gluten is unique. If it comes into contact with water, it forms an elastic network. This gives the dough simultaneously strength and flexibility. Cereals or cereal-like plants without gluten don't achieve that. This is a dough made of rice, and you can see its consistency isn't good because it contains no gluten. It has no elasticity and the structure isn't good. Without gluten, the rice dough can't form a network. The dough disintegrates. In baked form, too, the difference is clear. Bread made from rice flour is compact and tight, rather than light and crispy. For people with gluten intolerance, so-called celiac disease, they are not a satisfactory alternative. Celiac disease is a frequently hereditary autoimmune disease in which the wall of the small intestine is destroyed. In a healthy body, the intestine filters nutrients from chewed food through the villi, for example, sugars, fats, amino acids and trace elements, and passes them on to the bloodstream. In the case of celiac disease, the gluten protein destroys the villi. As a result, nutrients can only be ingested with difficulty. And the mucous membrane of the small intestine becomes inflamed and permeable to bacteria and microbes. The symptoms are very painful, from stomach ache, bloating, diarrhea, fatigue, to depression and growth disorders in children. Celiac patients have to stay away from foods containing gluten for their whole life. The relationship between wheat gluten and celiac disease was first established in 1941. But the search for an alternative to gluten, which celiac sufferers could also eat, has not been easy. In addition to rice, there are other crops that do not contain the gluten protein. Millet, for example, or pseudo-cereals such as buckwheat, quinoa, kia and amaranth. However, even they do not have the properties of wheat gluten. But the Italian scientist and her team take another way. From other scientific research, we know that corn has a protein mixture that is very close to wheat gluten. Corn protein can also form a network in dough. Now, Vienna Czerny and her team have to find the right method of extracting the protein from the wheat so it can be produced in large quantities. Wheat protein also contains zein, a storage protein in the wheat, like gluten. Ombretta Polenghi helped to search for the appropriate method from the very start. It wasn't easy to find this method. Even though there are already existing methods to extract zein, they're used in the pharmaceutical sector and they're quite complicated. So for us, it was difficult to find an easy way to get zein in an intact form. Extracting the wheat protein zein requires the right mix of water, alcohol, and flour. Zein combines with the alcohol and separates from the flour starch. The concentrated solution is finally heated until the alcohol and water have evaporated, leaving behind the pure protein in powdered form. But finding the right mixing ratio is not easy. We worked very hard on these solutions. It wasn't easy to find the right formula. After countless trials, the Italian scientists are finally successful. On the basis of zein, it is now possible to produce bread, pasta, pastries and other foods that are gluten-free and still taste good. Even if you have to give up gluten for your whole life, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy food. 
With her research, Vienna Czerny has helped to bring more enjoyment and better health to countless people worldwide. Eight hundred boxes, eight hundred ideas. And they're all to do with him, Elmar Mock. He's turned inventing into an art form. Even though his first great invention is lying in one of the lower boxes, that doesn't make it any the less spectacular. When the Swiss watch industry was having problems, Elmar Mock reinvented the wristwatch. He came up with the Swatch. The special trick was the use of a new material for a watch, plastic. The idea, having fewer separate components, would make the whole thing cheaper. With his colleague Jacques Müller, he set to work. Müller had the watchmaking expertise, while engineer Mock was skilled in plastics processing and ultrasonic welding. To achieve the objective, new technologies had to be introduced to minimize work stages and to create far more complex forms. In other words, we used plastic to make not only the movement, but also the case. That way, the quality was sharply increased and the price sharply reduced. The development work at the watch company ITA was top secret. The two inventors melted and combined watch components. The result? A timepiece made of just 51 parts, instead of around double that amount. But the cheap watch wasn't immediately popular. Everyone was against it. They said it was a promotional item at best, and that surely no Swiss product could ever be made of plastic. What a cheap watch, they said. And they also believed that a watch that couldn't be repaired was a bad thing. There again, if it can't be repaired, then its quality has to be that much better. Countless designs were added, all fully in line with the trends of the 1980s. It was a triumph for the Swiss watch industry. But for Mock, the pioneer, this success took a lot of the fun out of it. For a chaotic person like myself, it was a wonderful time. But then the success of Swatch suddenly brought in order, structure, rules and systems that made me feel uncomfortable. So I wanted to get back into innovation again. And so it was that the Swatch didn't mark the end of his inventing career, but the beginning of it. Many people think that delving more deeply into what you already know brings novelty. I feel that you have to be curious, you have to see other things, you have to be inspired by nature, technology or people. You can't find mushrooms on a motorway. But inspiration isn't enough on its own. You also have to discover the benefits behind it. A tree in the ground seems to be very stable, but the earth with the tree inside it is not so stable. However, the tree's roots, its fractal connection with the soil, give it very high stability. Mock recognized this potential and adapted it to plastic. Injected into a porous substrate and liquefied using ultrasound, it solidifies within a fraction of a second inside the pores. Like the roots, the connection holds and no screws are needed. This so-called welding works with wood, plastic and even with bone enabling ultra-gentle operating techniques. Air, soap, water, and a further gentle application. That's what Mock focused on in his next big area of research. It saves resources, but not at the expense of hygiene. Smixin is the name of his new hand-washing machine. The objective was to use less water. Today you need a lot of water because you have to rinse. And during rinsing, you dissolve the soap that's concentrated on your hands. This enables me to dose the volume of soap and the volume of water precisely. So the whole hand washing process can be done with only this amount of water. Normally you need 1 to 1.5 litres. The smart mixing unit saves 90% water and 60% soap. The device doesn't need a water supply, it's mobile, so it can be placed anywhere. One core invention, many applications. That's typical of the all-rounder mock. The most economical shower will use up only two instead of eight litres in the future. Tests are already underway. The future lies in information technology. The inventor is certain of that. 
I see a big future in optical sensors. Like our eyes, they need to be mobile and they need to be able to adapt. In smartphones, his mini motor has already been installed, a tiny drive that focuses incredibly quickly in the macro range. But my most important contribution to the world of inventions is this here, a collection of professional inventors, the Crayaholic. And this is really my life's work. Creativity and workaholism. The name says it all. Have ideas, take them seriously, try them out together and work on an equal footing. Mock founded his creative collective, as he terms it, in 1986. Whether workshop, kitchen or office, Everything is a creative space for the approximately 55 employees. I have great colleagues here. They really are very creative people. And a wolf needs a pack. You can't do much on your own. You can do far more in a team. So this bundling together of skills and also expertise enables us to transcend our own limits. That's why a team like this is important. Elmar Mock's magic formula has worked. He's created numerous startups along with jobs as a result of all his inventions. 178 patent families bear his name. An incredible output for a 30 year long inventing career. The Blue Gate in Fez, Morocco, is the entrance to a different world. Anyone who passes through it finds themselves in the old town. The Medina of Morocco's oldest royal city, a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. A place full of history, colors, and above all, aromas. This is the world of Adnan Ramal. Les plantes aromatiques Aromatic plants and spices have been used in the Moroccan culture for a very long time. For medicinal purposes, to cure various ailments, as well as in cooking. Even before I became a scientist, I was convinced that aromatic plants contain pharmaceutical active ingredients. And aromatic plants and spices did indeed become very important for the pharmacologist Adnan Ramal. For their fragrances are nothing but chemical compounds, special molecules from essential plant oils. The plants use them as a weapon. They use them to fight off bacteria and parasites. Adnan Ramal wanted to make this weapon his own. In 1998, I met some surgeons who explained to me how they were often successful in difficult operations, but that many patients still died in hospitals from becoming infected with multi-resistant germs, against which antibiotics are no longer effective. On that day, I decided to dedicate my entire research career to this topic. I wanted to fight multi-resistant bacteria and find a solution to this problem. Adnan Ramal finds the opportunity to do this at the University of Fez. Here, he devotes himself to meticulous basic research. Finally, he understands exactly how the substances from essential oils fight bacteria. However, the researcher also realizes that to defeat infections and germs in humans, he would have to use a large amount of such substances. But that is not possible. The amount of essential oils we would need to give patients is rather high. And there's a big risk of side effects. So, we decided that if we couldn't use essential oils on their own, we would mix them together with antibiotics and try to create a synergy effect. Ramal searches for a substance that can make antibiotics extra powerful. And he finds it, carvacrol, contained, for example, in marjoram, thyme and oregano. Together with antibiotics, 
this substance becomes a medical weapon that can kill resistant bacteria. An antibiotic is like a key that unlocks a door in the bacterium and fights it that way. But if the bacterium mutates and the key no longer fits, then the bacterium is invulnerable and resistant. We've shown that the essential oils don't function like a key, but more like a sledgehammer that basically smashes the whole door down. Adnan Romal patents his discovery. In the meantime, he's also making use of a substance found in eucalyptus trees. Together with the Moroccan pharmaceutical company, he wants to bring the antibiotics booster with its eucalyptus essence onto the market. According to the researcher, it will be the first drug ever developed in Morocco. But Adnan Ramal already has new ideas. He now wants to prevent resistant bacteria from forming in the first place. Antibiotics have long been used in agricultural livestock farming and to accelerate the growth of the animals. This excessive use has caused many resistant bacteria to develop. But on this farm, things are different now. Every evening, the cattle here are given small pellets filled with essential oils. Antibiotics are no longer necessary. The livestock owner thus achieves the same growth effect as with antibiotics. At the same time, the animals are healthier and perform better. We were surprised that consumers are saying that the meat tastes better, is more tender, and it even smells better. Meanwhile, Adnan Ramal has little time for lab research. More and more farmers want to try out his new medication. It's 30% cheaper than antibiotics, and word has spread about its positive effect on meat. The fact that no more resistant bacteria are being produced has almost become a side issue now. For Adnan Ramal, however, it remains crucial. After all, he's devoted his life to fighting this global threat. <laughs>